All right, so hi everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dorian Karp, and I am the Advocacy and Policy Director of Jewish Women International. And we convene the Interfaith Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, um, who is hosting this three-part webinar series. Um, and this is the second session of that series. Um, I thought we could start with introductions from people that are on the line. If you're able to go on video, that would be great um, if you could introduce yourself. Um, if not, then you can put it in the chat. I'll put in what the introductions should entail here. I'm thinking like name, pronouns, organization you're interning for, if you're interning for an organization where you're calling in from, because I know we're all over the country. Um, and if relevant, like what brought you to this work? Like, why are you interning at a faith-based org? If you are, um, why are you participating in this webinar? Um, stuff like that. Um, so I'll be quiet and I'll let you guys go. Hi, I can go really quickly. Um, my name is Juliette. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm working for uh, Sojourners right now. I'm interning at Sojourners. Um, so that is the reason why I'm here uh, as part of the um, uh, something that a, a friend reached out, um, a coworker reached out about to attend. So that's awesome, Juliette. Anyone else able to introduce themselves to the group today or want to um, write in the chat the answers to some of these questions? Totally get it, Jennifer. Wi-Fi problems. We've all we've all experienced them. I'll go. My name is Duncan Winburn. Um, my pronouns are he, him. I'm in Columbia, South Carolina in the United States right now. I'm interning with Karama and um, I started interning with Karama because I honestly, I didn't really know much about the Muslim faith before. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to learn. And um, my boss, told everybody about this webinar and it looked interesting. So I decided to attend. That's great. Thanks, Duncan. Is your boss Rama or someone else at Karama? Karama. Uh, Rama Abdulalim. She's yeah. one of the head people, I think. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for introducing yourselves. Um, I think one person joined after I wrote in the chat. So if you could just your name, um, pronouns, if you're interning somewhere where that is um, and where you're calling us from um, either domestically or internationally. I know there were some people that reached out that were abroad. Um, so we'll get started. So the point, the first webinar that we held really looked at um, the major Abrahamic faiths Judaism, Christianity, um, and Islam, um, and what kind of organizations are doing um, in the United States um, in terms of advocacy and also in terms of um, domestic violence service provision um, in the faith context and for people of faith. Um, that is up on our website, the Interfaith Coalition website. So hopefully you all have either attended last session um, or watched it. Um, if you attend or watch all three of the sessions, um, you'll get an email um, with a survey where you like will say that you participated in the series and accomplished all the sessions. Um, and you'll get a certificate of completion. Um, that should be something cool to add to a resume uh, at some point. So um, I'm just gonna, so today I'm gonna walk us through like, what is the Interfaith Coalition? Like, what are the organizations that you're interning for doing in this coalition? What does that look like? Um, how do organizations um, that have different identities, different missions um, in some contexts, and maybe don't agree on every single policy position um, or best way forward, how do we come together? And what does that look like? 
Um, I'm also free to answer any questions you have about like the work that I do, either JWA, JWI or leading this coalition, um, what that looks like. Happy to do that as well, in like a more personal capacity, but we'll get started with the IC. Um, and I think the best way to do this really is to uh, um, look through the website. So what I'm going to do is share my screen. If you give me a second, we'll just do the whole desktop, which will be fine. And then I should go here and you guys can see all of my emails. And I'll open the IC website. Okay, so we're good, right? You guys can see the IC website. Tell me if you can't. Okay. So this is our website. Thank you. Um, I actually made it. So that's one of the fun things that I've done um, as the coalition leader in the space. Um, as you can see, it's in interfaithagainstdv.org. Um, and so there, um, here on the homepage, um, there's this great image that our marketing person worked on. Um, and as you can see, it's composed of 38 national faith organizations. Um, the original mission of the Interfaith Coalition was to work on domestic policy um, that supports women and girls um, and ending gender-based violence. Um, and over the course of the last few years, that has expanded a little bit. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but we scroll down. What do we do? I just mentioned um, we started in 2007. Um, JWI convened. Okay, hold on. New person joining. Um, JWI convened this coalition. Um, and so we've been around for almost like 15 years, is that where we are in terms of timeline? Um, my boss actually is the one that created it and convened it. She's now the chief policy um, programs officer at JWI. Um, and so it's really just been an opportunity to have lots of different organizations with similar missions coming together. Um, over the course of the last few years, I've been at JWI for a little over three. Um, we've been meeting regularly, monthly. Um, originally, I believe it was quarterly meetings. Um, but now we meet every month um, with an agenda that I put together um, and we talk about both kind of legislative priorities and ways that um, the Interfaith Coalition can support kind of like the broader gender-based violence movement. Um, kind of how can we leverage the importance of faith and the different ways that um, elected officials kind of see faith groups and like how can we enter spaces um, that the tr traditional kind of secular movement um, may not be able to enter and how do we kind of convince and what is our role. So that's really been um, a huge piece of the IC's work over the last few years. Um, just trying to move the ball forward both in our own, um, both in our own capacity and then also kind of as an assistant um, to the broader movement. Um, so we keep scrolling down here. Um, on the left, you can see our current members. I would say of this group of 38 or 40, um, 10 are real active participants. Um, you can probably see that through the, the organizations that are represented on this call. Um, we have Karama is very present. Sojourners, of course, is very present. Islamic Relief USA. Um, we have um, Sisters of the Good Shepherd is there, um, Catholics for Family Peace, Peaceful Family Project, um, uh, the RAC and the Jewish tradition, uh, a bunch of organizations that are kind of attend every month. And then I'd say there's another five or so um, that attend um, when they can. Um, it's not necessarily like a number one priority, but maybe like a two or three priority. Um, and then a lot more that are on a listserv and participate in sign on letters and active in, like engagement, um, but don't necessarily come to all of the meetings. And so that's a little bit about kind of like the, the makeup of the Interfaith Coalition. 
um, and what that looks like. One of the main components um, that the IC works on every year, kind of like a mainstay of the Interfaith Coalition work is for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So um, there are months for basically every kind of policy initiative you could think of um, that the federal government um, supports and usually there's um, some kind of resolution in Congress about it. Um, it's passed, it's, it's, it's a law, it doesn't actually influence anything other than um, creates an opportunity for more focused um, kind of prioritization of that issue in any given month, right? So like we just had Pride Month, um, that's obviously one that's like very well known, um, like there's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, there's all of these different kinds of um, months of prioritization for issues and for domestic violence, um, it's October. There's also Sexual Assault Awareness Month, Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, every kind of month you could imagine um, in this space. But the IC prioritizes domestic violence um, in our work. And so that's what we really focus on. So every year we do something. Um, what that looks like changes based upon what's happening in the world, based upon the capacity of the Interfaith Coalition, who's engaged, who's participating, um, and what that looks like. So we'll go backwards in time. Um, last year for 2020, um, we did a really big series. Um, it was a four part series in October. So every week of the month, um, we had a webinar and this was really um, brought on and kind of conceptualized um, after the um, death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, um, and about Arbery and a host of Brenna Taylor and a host of other um, people of color, and really thinking about what is the role of the Interfaith Coalition? What is the intersection of misogyny, racism, and safety and justice look like? What are the ways that the IC um, can look at those intersections? Um, so really kind of outside of the, the direct scope of legislative advocacy and much more expansive. Um, though we did, we did talk um, in each of the sessions about policies um, that if passed would, would help and remedy or, or promote um, greater safety for the communities that were represented. So, um, also two other organizations I didn't mention that are very good and pr very participatory members, um, uh, the Baha'i Office, Baha Office um, uh, Public Affairs, United States, um, as well as the Friends Committee on National Legislation. So if you look our first, and if you're interested in any of these, it's up on this website and on YouTube. Um, so systemic racism in the DV context, right? So here we have a group um, of both um, faith as well as secular groups um, speaking, speaking directly to this intersection. Um, great panel um, by Rama Abdulalim, actually Duncan and a few other of you um, at Karama. So if you wanna see Rama in action, here's a good space for that. Um, the next um, issue we talked about um, were, was focused on Native American survivors um, in Indian country and what, um, what gender-based violence looks like there and the, the challenges that they, that they have that um, are very unique, um, both because of um, how rural reservations are, um, but also because of the different legal status um, that tribal governments have. Um, so that was really interesting. Also a mix um, of faith as well as secular based organizations. Um, and we had FCNL, the Friends Committee on National Legislation um, moderating that um, as an IC member. Um, then we, for our third series, we really looked at economic inequality and homelessness um, and poverty as an intersection in this work. Obviously, um, those who are unhoused um, or have um, difficult or, or live in poverty or have difficulty 
um, with financial sustainability and security um, are more um, have a more difficult time creating safety and uh, navigating our justice system or our criminal legal system. Um, so this had breakout sessions and was like a really interactive um, and very thoughtful um, uh, kind of session. And Reverend Lucinda Kent is based in DC. Um, and she, as the pastor of Van Buren United Methodist Church, actually runs a shelter um, for uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence and their families. Um, so she spoke a little bit about what it looks like um, in, in, her, in her faith context and in a congregation context um, to do this work. Um, while as Negar Abai talked about it a little bit more um, theoretically and philosophically. The final session that we did um, looked at the alternative models for safety and justice, right? So over the course of the last um, like two years, there's been a real focus on community-based interventions, on restorative justice, on performative justice. And so what is the role of faith um, in creating those spaces um, uh, where maybe communities don't want to access the criminal legal system or can't access the criminal legal system. Um, and so what are alternatives um, to using that system um, and getting and, and finding accountability and justice um, for perpetrators or harm doers as well as survivors. And in, in, in through all of this work, we were talking about pieces of legislation like the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and there are a bunch of pieces of legislation specifically on, um, on, on tribal um, issues that Carrie remarked upon. Um, and um, so that was a really, and, and also kind of anti-policing, putting more money um, right now into the appropriations, um, all of that. So super successful, we had over 650 people from around the world sign up. Um, and we were really, really happy with um, kind of how that, how that looked and how that worked and the engagement that we were able to get. See the previous year in 2019, ah, we did a social media campaign. Um, so I don't know if you can see this here, but it says, let's look. My faith teaches me to advocate for. Um, and so we had our IC members send this um, PDF out um, to their memberships, to their congregations. Um, and there was a little carrot above the my faith. So like my Jewish faith, my Baha'i faith, my Sikh faith, my whatever faith um, teaches me to advocate for. And here we have a community and dignity um, we have survivors, justice, um, honoring the experiences of all God-given um, people and the dignity of all, um, the oppressed, um, a whole range. And so what we did is we had a social media day um, where these were all posted. And then I also collected this and put this on social, um, really just to elevate kind of the a lot of people um, kind of pre the IC, and I guess still a lot of people think of faith as a barrier um, to seeking justice, seeking accountability, um, to safety. Um, and we believe as part of the IC that it can, it, it's, it's not a barrier. It doesn't have to be a barrier. It can really, um, it can really be the opposite. It can be the strength that you have in your community um, and faith can provide um, that space that um, allows for um, a survivor to feel, to become whole and feel safe. Um, and so this was really trying to uplift the, the role that faith has and that um, as an interfaith coalition and as faith voices and faith-based organizations, um, our faiths teach us that, um, you know, survivors are whole, they should not live in marriages that um, are dangerous, uh, and really giving um, the power back um, to women and the power of faith in supporting, um, supporting women and survivors, all survivors, really. Um, 
So we felt like this was, this was a good way of doing that. Um, it was built on a, a previous year's campaign that was very similar. Um, we also used um, faith text or faith poetry, um, some, some writings of faith um, that support um, the idea um, uh, of women uh, of women being safe um, and ending gender-based violence, right? We, we all know, I think, as people that are working in this space, that sometimes textual language can be twisted and used um, to oppress, to oppress lots of different groups. Um, and we are trying to counter that narrative here um, by saying there are other texts, there are other ways of seeing. Um, hi, Jihad. Hey, good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome. Um, there are other ways of looking at faith um, that support survivors. And we had, let's see. Um, oh, and I created some social media resources. Here are some um, of the tweets that we created for the Interfaith Coalition groups, um, as well as kind of those outside uh, in different various coalitions to uplift this message um, with the hashtag faith support survivors. And here is that really cool um, PDF that you saw all of the, the diverse groups of faith um, individuals uh, holding up in those signs. And then it looks like we also did a VAWA webinar. Um, so VAWA is the Violence Against Women Act. Um, it is really massive, and I'm not going to go into it really here. If you have any questions on VAWA, I'd be happy to answer them offline. But it is the first piece of legislation that was created in 94 um, that criminalized domestic violence and took domestic violence from the um, kind of role of in the family into the into a role into a violent act that was seen by uh, by our governments, by our culture, by our criminal legal system um, as as uh, as a felony, as a misdemeanor, as something to be taken really seriously. Um, and so this bill has been um, reauthorized and funded um, since 1994. Um, and has been up for reauthorization for about three years now without bipartisan support. Um, and so we need 60 votes in the Senate to get it passed. And so it, we're still, the IC is still working on this and has been for the last few years, I think since 2018. Um, and so we did a webinar series uh, for people to learn a little bit more, um, both about the particular piece of legislation and the improvements we're hoping for um, as well as kind of the lay of the lands, like where are we? There have been lots of twists and turns over the last few years um, as we're trying to get it reauthorized. And when I say we, I mean the IC and the entire gender-based um, policy kind of movement. Quickly, I'll go back to 2018. Um, and we also had the same hashtag, Faith Takes Action. Um, some social media resources. Here we did um, a panel discussion um, as well. And I think the previous year, which isn't on here, we did a discussion on um, immig immigration um, and what, I don't know if you guys remember, but in the, whoo, how do I get this back? Here we go. Um, in the Trump administration, um, basically, at the beginning, middle, the Trump administration, he was greatly restricting um, immigration through uh, through the Mexico border, um, really harming survivors of gender-based violence. And he did all he passed a regulation and did a bunch of stuff. Um, so we looked at um, what is the role and how are um, immigration groups um, and asylum groups um, working at this intersection of gender-based violence as well. Um, so we have taken, we've really looked at our role and seen like, what is faith doing? What is happening in the news? What's happening in the media? What's happening in our world? And how do we, how do we come together and what can we add our voices to and um, leverage our support on? 
We also um, collect faith resources, and this is constantly updating and changing. I actually just added um, a faith resource from um, the Sikh community um, about a guideline of, of um, how faith leaders in Gurdwalas, which is their kind of place of worship, um, like what they can do, um, and it's in Punjabi and English. So these are constantly being updated and revised um, as organizations in our interfaith coalition do that work. Um, so this is just here, here by the way, is last week's um, uh, recording, if you haven't watched it. Um, and here are all of these resources. So as you can, if, if you're ever working in another organization, in this space or anyone comes to you with a question, um, you know, what, what resources are out there for religious leaders or for people that just wanna learn a little bit more, this is a great place. It's a consolidation um, of a lot of different resources and many different languages um, on domestic violence and the whole range um, of, of, of gender-based violence issues. So here we have Safe Havens, Peaceful Family Project, Catholics for Family Peace, Sojourners, the Sikh Family Center, United Methodist Church, Jakarta, JWI, our organization has a resource. Um, we will speak out, Conference of Catholic Bishops, Catholics for Family Peace, um, and we're always happy to add any organization. So if you're working for one and you know of a resource, um, or if you've worked for previous organizations and know of a resource, I'd be happy to, to add it to our list. Um, this is obviously not, um, not everything that exists out there, um, but we're happy to um, lift those up. And then press in the newsroom, not really much is on here. Events you can look at, um, and this is where you signed up for the series. Um, so it lists all the upcoming events. And then you can see some of the past events as well. Um, and if you have any questions on any of those, I'd be happy to answer that. So, I mean, really what I want you to take away from this session, and it's gonna be a little bit quicker, I think, than the other sessions really is that, oh, someone new is coming, great. Um, so what I really hope you take away from this is that while obviously our faiths and the faiths represented on the Interfaith Coalition um, are different, right? Um, uh, that all of our faiths teach us um, that all everyone deserves protection, that um, women and girls particularly deserve protection, that nobody um, should be oppressed that um, faith should serve as a resource um, and that we all come together, even though we may not agree on every single thing, um, to come together to kind of leverage our reach um, and our voice and our support um, for lifting up um, survivors um, and kind of working to um, end gender-based violence and domestic and sexual violence, both through the ways that we communicate, um, through the ways we educate our membership um, and through work kind of at, at the Hill level. I didn't mention, I think in a previous maybe Domestic Violence Awareness Month, or maybe I forgot to add it to, to one of these, um, we've done both lobbying um, so, or advocacy, as we would say. So meeting with actual Hill offices and talking about particular pieces of legislation and why the Interfaith Coalition and why different organizations in the Interfaith Coalition care, um, what our experiences are, how our faith, uh, how our faith leaders and how our faith members experience domestic violence and what are some particular needs um, in these faith communities. We lift those up um, for our Hill offices. Um, and we also have collected um, sign-on letters um, and gotten um, faith organizations, both national faith organizations as well as local faith organizations to sign on in support of particular pieces of legislation like VAWA and like, for instance, um, closing the boyfriend loophole, which I don't know if many of you know about, um, but is a loophole in federal law that allows um, people convicted of dating violence 
um, still to be able to have a firearm if they so choose. Um, so this is someone that's been adjudicated as having committed a pretty serious level of violence um, against their partner, um, but because they're not married to them um, or have a child in common with them, they're still able to um, have access to a firearm, which of course is very dangerous, um, not only to that survivor, um, but anyone that they get into a relationship with in the future. Um, so anyway, that's just to say that like we do a lot of this kind of social media outreach. We've done these webinars to try to um, kind of educate folks and really help them understand some of these intersections and, and how faith-based organizations play a role in this, but also working on um, the federal legislative advocacy um, to create change um, on that level as well. So I've done a lot of talking. It's been about, I don't know, 25 minutes. Um, and I'm gonna stop my share. And I am happy to answer any questions that you have either about um, the IC, the website, my role, anything that has like popped up for you. And then we will, um, if there are any questions, I'll answer them. And then um, I'll just quickly review what the next what the next session in this series will look like. So I'll be quiet now, give people an opportunity either to go off mute um, or a lot of you said that you were um, in kind of crowded, busy areas. If you have any questions, happy to answer them from the chat. Okay. Um, I'm also happy. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Nicholas. Sorry, I just had a quick question. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was properly signed up um, just because I haven't been getting uh, the emails and everything. So um, like today, unfortunately, I joined a bit late just because I didn't have the direct links. So maybe if you could help me figure out just how to make sure that I'm properly signed up for everything. For sure. So I just added my email in the chat for Nicholas and for everybody else, if this is a problem that you're having, or if um, you want to reach out to me after this meeting, that's cool too. Um, so Nicholas, if you want to email me just so I have your email and I can look into like our back end and make sure that you're signed up and that you get um, the recording of this and any uh, ends like the registration for the next session. Anyone else with a logistical question or any other question? Okay. The only other thing I'll add before I conclude um, is that I want you to really think of the IC as a resource, but also myself as a resource. Um, I moved to DC about three and a half or four years ago knowing that I wanted to do this policy work um, to create more gender equity and did and hadn't worked in the space previously directly like it wasn't something that I had exactly done I had a lot of skills that I had built through the years but it wasn't something that I um, found easy to enter into the space and so for those of you that are in college or in grad school or thinking about wanting to do this I'm happy to offline with you and kind of think through um, how you do that and, and act as a resource um, as you're thinking through that and trying to navigate, um, navigate kind of this job world that I know is really, really challenging and I would imagine is especially challenging in this era of, of virtualness um, and kind of weird coffees. Um, so I just wanted to add that as well. So feel free to write down my email um, and reach back out. No problem, Gil. All right, so 
The next session is next Thursday. It'll go a little bit longer. It'll be from two to 3.30 and not just two to three like um, this was billed or the previous session. Um, and we're doing that because it's going to be like a job fair type session. Um, so hopefully all of you have signed up for it. If not, now you know how to navigate the Interfaith Coalition website. Um, and we'll be able to sign up for it. We're having 10 organizations represented in addition to JWI, because I'll be um, kind of kicking it off and closing it as well. Um, and each organization is being given six minutes to speak to their work. So you can kind of get a better understanding of, of the organizations represented both in the IC and like where all these people are. <laughs> <laughs> are working that are participating in this in this series with you. Um, I'm really hoping that it will um, provide an opportunity for you to see um, how faith-based organizations are engaging in this work. And many of the organizations that are represented work on issues outside of gender-based violence, um, on issues like poverty, on immigration, um, uh, justice, civil rights, um, decriminalization. There's lots of lots of stuff. JWI particularly works on um, like women's issues, so uh, economic security, a, a wide range of things. Um, and so this will also show you not only what's happening in the space um, and gender-based violence, but also much more broadly, like what is the and most of the organizations are based in DC. So like, what is at faith-based advocacy in DC look like? Um, so hopefully it'll provide you a lay of the land um, and provide maybe other opportunities for internships or jobs possibilities or different people for you to connect to. Um, and I highly recommend you use next, week, next week's opportunity um, to reach out if there's anyone working at an organization or an organization that really interests you or excites you that you learn about next week. A lot of the people that'll be um, speaking are just as open as I am and want to be able to help kind of the next generation of leaders in this movement. And so um, I hope that you utilize um, the resources um, and the individuals that will be speaking next week. I'm sure they went through LinkedIn, through direct email, through however you figure out how to contact. And if you need any questions or uh, if you have any questions or need any help navigating that, I'd be happy to walk you through that as well. Because that's an important um, component of internships and figuring out um, how, to, how to leverage this internship that you have to either your next or your job um, or figuring out what you wanna do um, in the future. And as you move on and figure out the rest of your lives. Um, so I hope that you'll all join me next week. And if you can't, then you'll watch the recording. Um, and I will leave it there unless there's anyone else that wants to add something or any other questions um, that have come up for you as I've been speaking for the last five-ish or so minutes. Well, Dorian, I just want to say thank you for organizing this series on behalf of Islamic Group, a, a partner uh, of the IC. Uh, the valuable information that you share with, our, with the interns, I see that one of, one of mine has attended. We had actually has a couple of conflicting meetings going on right now, so I was glad that Neil was able to attend and I step in for a little bit. That's why I came in a little late, but um, I do really uh, promote people to attend next week's event and definitely get that certificate by attending all events to have on uh, your, your resumes. And, and as, as she was mentioning, for many of you who may want to return to Washington, D.C., uh, pursue advocacy careers, government affairs careers around, you know, ending domestic violence and sexual violence, you know, please do consider all the member organizations, uh, particularly those with DC-based offices that are members of the IC. Uh, so you know, we're, we're happy to always to see that people eventually at some point comes back around uh, that we see people on the resumes. IC Leadership Summit Series, and, and how we can see, you know, those marginal differences when you're trying to be competitive in a DC, in a, off, in a city that is very competitive already. You want to get it, it's all the experiences that you can to have a rich experience uh, to bring to any potential organization in the future that's going to benefit from your knowledge, expertise, and networks. So thank you, Dorian, for helping facilitate that uh, for all the interns for our various organizations. And Jihad, really quickly, do you want to lift up that social that you guys are doing? Oh, sure. Uh, great. 
here, just give me one second while I also fidget real quick with my fingers. Or, or Gil, I like um, Gil, you're on. Can you go to your web, your email, find the link for the social? So on at the end of the year, for the past seven years, Islamic Leaf uh, has. Uh, Yep, and Gil just put that in, the, 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 there it is. She is actually organizing it for us. Gil is one of our three great public affairs interns and her major project of the year is helping to organize our annual, our seventh annual uh, DC summer intern social that we co-host with the Alliance to End Hunger uh, that you can also check out their website. Again, another great coalition with many faith-based uh, secular uh, research institute organizations that are focused on ending hungry, hunger and poverty here in the United States and internationally, but we host the internship social. Normally, in normal times outside of COVID, actually at their wonderful facilities at Breadth of the World, which is about three blocks from the U.S. Capitol, a C-suite penthouse uh, high-rise suite that looks over the Capitol. We usually get about 100 to 150 interns such as yourselves from various congressional offices, U.S. government offices, advocacy offices, government affairs, research institutes. It's an opportunity for you to network amongst yourselves. I think the best people for interns to learn from about other opportunities at other great institutions, organizations, and have what their career aspiration is, is from other interns. Um, so that's, we create that space at the end of the summer so you can share that with people you get to bump up. If you come to DC, you gotta learn how to network. So we're trying to help facilitate that experience. Um, Unfortunately, again, for this year, our second year in a row, because of the COVID pandemic, we can't do the program in public. Uh, inshallah, God willing, next year, if you come back, we'll have it in person back at Breath of the World. Uh, but this year, it will be virtual. You can register uh, and attend again on, it is actually on Thursday, uh, July 29th at 5 p.m. But please RSVP by the 24th if you can, so we can help allocate you to a, a group to network with various interns. Thank you. Of course, everyone should definitely do it. It's a bummer that it's not in person. Um, but I think, it, you know, part of being an intern, the importance of doing this work is connecting um, and, and building networks. And so thank you to Jihad um, for, for the work that their organization does. Um, thank you. And facilitating, coordinating that, super important. All right. I think that that's it. Um, thank you all for joining me today um, and make sure to reach out if you have any questions or need any help. All right, bye everyone. Thank you. Yeah, of course.